hope you're ready for session two tonight. We're going to be talking about some of the most difficult things that we might talk about this whole series. The title of this session is You Might Be Their Drug Dealer. Because the reality is that if you're helping them in certain ways that you could be enabling them to have the resources to continue to use drugs and alcohol. And so uh, we're going to hear from some folks tonight in the interviews that have had folks that lovingly tried to help them, but inadvertently made it worse. And so let's hear from them tonight and see how we can avoid enabling our loved ones. What are some ways that you guys may have manipulated family members to do things for you that they shouldn't have done? Make them feel guilty. Yeah, okay. Play, play off the weakness. Yeah, because they know you, you know that they love you, so you try to make them feel as worse as possible. Yeah. How dare you? You know, I mean, you know, I wouldn't do that. Or how dare you gonna throw me out into the streets? Yeah. Um, yeah, I got I got a lot of bills coming up. Can I get twenty bucks for gas? Mm -hmm. You know, I, all my money went to bills, and when none of it, you know, none of it did. Or I need this, I need that. Just stupid, and they get dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber. The excuses. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So. And and Ryan, what about you? What kinds of things? In the beginning, it's easy uh, because there's still a trust. But when the trust, the questions come, why do you need this money? You've been working or the the manipulation comes in and the new ideas come in and once those ideas like my car has a flat tire mm -hmm. once those things wear out and you've your cars have four flat tires this month <laughs> then you have to start really playing on people's emotions and that's when the manipulation of guilt yeah. and chain things like that come in and you use love people's love for you against them so what are some things that family members did for you that they probably shouldn't have you gave me money mm -hmm. place to live keys to the car really so did they know you were using them when they gave you money i mean did they have did they were suspecting they had to have known in the back of their head you know, I know as a parent, you wouldn't want to believe, you know, hey, my, my, my baby's a, a heroin addict or shooting drug. You don't want to believe that. Right. But, so, I mean, I, I want to think that they did because my, my parents are ex-addicts. They've got 20 years clean. Wow. So it was a little harder to manipulate them, but you still find a will. If there's a will, you're, there's a way, you know, being an addict, you're going to get your fix. Wow. So you manipulated people that had been in your shoes. Yeah, huh. I remember one time I snuck into my dad's house. I knew where he kept his wallet. I took his his credit card. I knew the PIN number. And I didn't get but two uses at it before he knew exactly what it was. Oh, okay. So. Yeah. How, did any of you guys uh, steal from family? Oh, yeah. My mom and dad went on a vacation down floor and they come home to an empty house. Really? So about hot water tank, um, cabinets, um... Vanity. You sold all that out of the house? Yeah. Wow. So did they know before they left that you were no. using? No. Yeah, they knew I was using. Okay. They wouldn't give me no money. Okay. So then that's when you go from manipulating to stealing. Yeah, right. So because you have to have. You got to have. Somehow. Yeah. So if, if people cut you off, then... And family needs to understand that. If they cut you off and give you the tough love that you need, that doesn't mean that you're going to get better necessarily. It just means you might have to go deeper into the hole first. Yeah. And something else, Pastor Brian, I'd like to say, just because I'm thinking about now before you bring yeah. it up. Yeah. But society tells us so many times that, you know, we're addicts and we're just going to be using it again. Mm -hmm. And I just want people out there to know that that ain't what it is. You know, yeah, we did was an addict, but I was just living in sin. Yeah. You know, and when you come and find Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where the true love falls in place. Yeah. Absolutely. You know Absolutely. what I mean? And yeah. I just want to put that so that people here, because I used to use that to my advantage too. I'm going to meetings. Mm -hmm. I'm trying. Right. All of us slipped up. You know what I mean? And I just was wanting people to know that that's, you know, that ain't the truth. Right. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it is, and and I and I'll say this a lot um, in this in these interviews that discipleship in Jesus Christ is really the only way to recovery, and that it's not about the recovery. No, nope. it's not about just stopping using. Mm -hmm. It's about becoming who God created you to be in Christ Jesus, and that the recovery is a byproduct of your discipleship. Exactly, and, and I feel like. A lot of the programs out there, they focus in on you not using and make you focus on it more, right? Because that's all you talk about in all yeah. the meetings. Is, well, well, not just that. They tell you, you're going to fall. Right. Just pick yourself back up. Mm -hmm. So you already got in your mind that you're going to fall again. Right. But as long as I don't quit and just keep on going, mm -hmm. then I'm all right. Yeah. And no, that ain't what it is. And that's how much about the discipleship, about accountability. You know, I know from here on out that I got to have accountability partner with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No matter who it is, you know, my wife, my friend, you know, I, I know I can't be out by myself. Yeah. Yeah. What are some hard consequences that you guys uh, received for going down at the hole of darkness like that? Prison. You was in prison? Yeah. Homeless, living in my truck. Where yeah. About you. I was homeless for three years. My mom has a five-year protection order on me. Wow. Um, I'm about to go through a divorce. Um, my children are just now coming back into my life. And I have nothing to my name except for the clothes that I have here at the ministry that I'm in. Okay. So you were three years homeless. Where did you stay? Uh, I bounced around between trap houses, which are drug houses. Uh, I stayed under a railroad trussle. Um, most of the time I stayed high and walked to stay warm. Um, I mean, I was out in shorts and snow last winter. And how um, did you stay high if you were on the streets? You don't have to go into uh, great detail, but anything I could do, I would steal, lie, cheat, manipulate, anything I had to do. Okay. Um, shoplifting, any, yeah. anything that could result in money. Mm -hmm. I would work too, but mm -hmm. um, sometimes work is a form of just a pathway to getting what you need. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Uh, enabling. Sometimes oh. work is a form of enabling. Okay. So, it, in other words, if you're using and somebody's like, well, if I just... In other words, people might think, well, if I just get them back to work, everything will... You know, I think that's one of the fallacies, too, that families have, and you confirm this if I'm right. Nobody's ever going to get to the point... Like, if you're living in someone's home and they know you're an addict and that you need to get your life turned around... You're probably, as long as you got a warm place to sleep, no one pressuring you to quit what you're doing, and all the things you need to continue using, uh, are you ever going to get to a point on your own where you say you're done mm -hmm. in that setting? Uh, why would you? Yeah. So, so people who wait, and I think there are a lot of loved ones who are like, well, if I just give it time... They'll get to the point where they don't want to do this anymore, and we don't want them to be on the street because we love them and all that. Is it? I mean, what what do, what's wrong thinking uh, with adults that feel that way? Why why is that wrong for them to? If you wait, sometimes it could cost them their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that next use could they could overdose. The yeah. very next instance where they decide to use you could lose them for the rest of your life. Well, and, and the truth is, they could deliver tough love and their loved one could still overdose and die. Absolutely. But... They're going to stay there and they can die too. Right. Death is, is, is going to be between them and God, but as far as we go as parents or mm -hmm. loved ones of addicts, we still got to make the choices that give them the only hope of recovery, and that means... Sending them out the door. Yeah, I know. Like, my aunt would not give me no money. Like, when I ask for <coughs> money or anything, like, I ask for diapers for the kids, uh, she would never give me no money. She'd go and buy everything. Yep. And then that's how she knew that, because uh, I'll, I'll get, I'll throw a fit. I'll get mad. <laughs> uh, why can't you just give me money? You know, make up some kind of 
you know, she'd be like, you know, I already know. Yeah. You know, so now I ain't gonna get you nothing because now I know that you don't. Right. You don't need it. Yeah, because you could always sell that stuff too. Yeah. Did you do that? Did you ask for stuff that you needed and then whatever people got you, did you sell it? Did you ever do that? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Everything you could, video games, shoes, hats. So really what people need to understand is any help, anything they can give you that's a value is in your mind almost like handing you the drugs. Yeah. Right? Only thing it's um, food, you know, giving somebody... Some, something to eat is different. Right. You know what I mean? but it's that's a consumable. It. You can't but, sell that. Probably. But anything yeah. else, no. Nope. Right. And, and I think that's hard, man. I mean, one of the if I ever write a book, one of the chapters is going to be, or it might be the title of the book, you might be your loved one's drug dealer. Mm -hmm. Because I think a lot of people don't realize they're the ones that are making it possible for them to continue down that road. Well, and that's like uh, my aunt, when I asked her for this last time, I asked her for a pizza. People should buy me a piece of she would. And she's like, no, I'm done with that. But I, you know, she's like, but I did take out a couple days out of my time and find out a place for you to go. And she said, and that's my love. And this is my last, you know, help. Wow. You go there, I'll help you. I'll get you whatever you need. Yeah. You know, as long as you're there doing good, then you don't have to worry about nothing. Was that here? Yep. Wow. So, and when I first come in, I had a little tote. You know, just a little thing. Had like maybe a couple pairs of pants, a couple pairs of socks. Yeah. You know, now I'm doing pretty good. You know, that, yeah. uh, God's blessed me. Just tell me again some of those things you've done as far as stealing stuff or using stuff to get money. Uh, I would, I would use my son to get money off my mother. Like say I needed diapers and really didn't need diapers and then take the diapers back and get a gift card and then take the gift card to the machine and get what is it the 80 percent mm -hmm. from that or oh something. wait so explain this because i don't know about this so you can use any gift card and get cash for it mm -hmm. yeah how There's, do you do that what's those machines Benny, called? it's almost a vending machine like a kiosk yeah yeah it's exactly what it is it's a kiosk machine really Just take the gift card and, and kroger's and cash back mm -hmm. so anybody who says well, I won't give them a way to get drugs. I'll just give them a gift card. That's right. not going to You can look at them lines for the machines and just see a line of people just tweaked out. Really? Mm. Wow. Okay. Or still cell phones. Dude, I would go to the bars and steal people's cell phones like when they weren't looking. Yeah. And then take the SIM card out and go to the cell phone machine. and. Sell. Wait, what's a cell phone machine? It says machines in the Kroger and stuff. Some of the Krogers you can take in, or the or in the malls. Yeah. Well, that Kroger in yeah. Newark got one. What is it? You take them in and sell your old phone. You put them in the machine and it recycles your phone. Yeah. And it gives you cash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What? A good amount of cash too. Yeah. Really? So if you stole somebody's iPhone. Yeah. And put it in there. Yeah. It mm -hmm. would give you a bunch of money for it. Yeah. Wow. See, I don't know any of this stuff. A lot of people don't know any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. All right. I've uh, taken a tablet of my daughter's to the pawn shop and then manipulated my family into going and getting it back for her. Um, I've asked for money for birthday presents or Christmas presents and just used the money for drugs. Uh-huh. Yeah. If you even suspect someone to use it, <coughs> yeah. you might as well just not even give them anything at all besides a, a meal. So what? Here's the problem: is how do how do family members who have always been loving, caring family members get to the point where they can trust their instincts about what they've learned about drug use and believe the facts or the signs over your words and manipulations? They make drug tests, offer a drug test. If they deny it, they're hiding. If they have nothing to hide, they'll take it. That's true. So it's just like seven bucks from CVS. Buy a drug test, test them. If they have nothing to hide, they'll take it. That's a great point. If they're hiding point. something, your instincts are right. If they say no. It's really the only black and white way to tell. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And now, tell people how they can cheat on a drug test. Fake urine. They make uh, fake urine at water beds and stuff. 
You can buy Terminator for $42. What's I, Terminator? It's a brand of pee that I've used it to get employment at jobs. And they got the Wizenator too. The Wizenator. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a fake. I've been busted on that. I've heard about that. <laughs> Friends pee and put it in a condom. Just hold it. They actually... Wait, uh, we got to tell people what the Wizenator is. <laughs> <laughs> It's a uh, it's a fake wiener. <laughs> so, because in some settings, the PO is going to watch you do your yeah. drug mm-hmm. test. So they've got to see something happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they usually have a mirror in front of you, and they stand behind you to where they can see everything. But you can use the Wizenator and fake them out. No, no because they no. make you pull up your shirt. Oh. Yeah, they want to look and see what's going, going around. So what's the Wizenator get around? Well, you used to get around, used to get around POs, but probation officers, but they're, they've caught on to that over the years. Now, is there ways to dilute stuff in your system quicker? Yeah, denture cleaner. What? Denture cleaner. The denture cleaner tablets. What? You mean you gotta, like... Eat it. Really? You drink water. Once you start peeing clear, you're good. Niacin. Niacin. What's niacin? Heats up your blood, thins your blood out, cleans your system up. Or See, you can drink a ton of water and pee it, a little bit in the toilet and then catch the mid-pee in the cup. Okay. So to get the toxins out first, and then you put the good pee in the cup. Wow. I mean, people don't know this stuff. And, like, for girls, they, um, my um, baby's mom had a plastic tube. Mm-hmm. And that's the reason why now that for females, they make you use it. Then you got to stop and hold it and use it again because they used to be able to just... Put like a room foil on it, oh. pop it, and let it come out, and then you would never even know. Wow. Okay, man. Um, how do people use in jail? <laughs> Are you allowed um, to say? Uh, <laughs> Are you allowed yeah, to say? They get um, get it in from the girlfriend, Juju, or one of the guards. Um. Like uh, when I was in jail, I had it brought in with on my um, glasses, reading glasses. Oh, really? Took the earpiece off, stuffed them with uh, some boxes, mm-hmm. and stuffed them back on there. All right. Most people, just, most people, uh, well, in, like in county jails, they just they use each other's meds, oh. cheat their meds, and you know a lot of people were on meds and stuff. So they just save them up, sell them, mm-hmm. so they're getting the money. Yeah, high dollar. Really? Especially for sleeping meds and stuff. Mm-hmm. What's a, what's uh, the prices of some of the prescription meds that get abused? What can you pay for a pill? Well, Suboxone goes for, you know, eight, ten bucks on the street. You can go for 150 for half of one. I don't see more than that now. It's just ridiculous. It's 18 on the street now, and they're, uh, like, if you go to Noble, they're $300 for a whole one. Now, how, what... Tell everybody what Suboxone is, because not everybody knows it's about it. It's a um, it's a drug to help you basically get off drugs. It's another drug. It's a prescription drug. Yeah, right? and it helps mm-hmm. you get off heroin. It uh, stops the withdrawals. And, um, you know, when you're not on heroin or withdrawing, really, it'll get you high. Mm-hmm. So people just have, you know, substitute Suboxone for whatever their drug was before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Opiates and opioids bond to your opiate receptors. Uh, naloxone is the active ingredient in Suboxone, and it bonds to your opiate receptor stronger than the opiates or opioids would. Okay. So it blocks, but it is also a mind altering substance. People use it for addicts for pain relief. Doctors prescribe it for that. Um, it, it does. It has the same reaction as heroin and Percocets or opioids. Mm-hmm. It's just that it bonds to your opiate receptor stronger, so you can't use the opioids or opiates over top of that because it won't bond with the naloxone in your system. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, what are some other like? What's a Percocet go for, and what milligram is usually street? Usually a dollar milligram. Dollar milligram. A yep. dollar milligram. Perk tens or would be ten bucks. But or perk thirties. What what's the highest dosage you get on the street? Thirty. Thirty. They usually go for thirty to thirty five bucks. Okay. And and so if you have a choice between perk, percocet, because okay, so a shot of heroin mm-hmm. 
how many Percocet 30s does it take to equal a shot? As far as getting high. Do a $10 shot be equal to a $30 Percocet? Really? So they're even? One Percocet would be like one shot of heroin? No. No. No, no there's a, it takes up probably about two, two thirties equal up for a 10. And the, how long does that high last? Depending on your tolerance. I won't even get you high, just get you well. Mm -hmm. Oh. So, yeah. so that's something else I think people don't understand is your tolerance builds up. And is that why people go to uh, go go to shooting up instead of taking uh, prescription drugs because they need more faster? In the beginning, I could snort or take Vicodin and get a little bit of a buzz, and then Percocet, a strong Percocet like a Percocet 20, would make me sick. But not long after I was doing that, I was snorting heroin, and as soon as heroin took over, I was, was injecting it. What do you mean took over? It, the My first taste of dope sickness came from Percocet 15s. Um, the repeated use, it gave me dependency. I, my body craved it, my body had to have it to function and that is what causes the sickness. And when you don't have that or you don't have the money to pay for the milligram of pill, uh, heroin's a dirtier substance. It's an easier way to get the medicine, the opiate, opposed to the opioid. Yeah, and it's cheaper, right? Yeah, it's a lot cheaper. cheaper. Yeah, mm -hmm. a lot more dangerous. Mm -hmm. right. It's cheaper now, it's more easier to get. You get heroin easier than pills now. Yeah. 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 So... Tell me real quick, each each of you, <coughs> what your drug of choice was. Everything. Oh, really? Yeah. So you used meth, yeah. cocaine, heroin. Crack, heroin, um, Xanaxes, Somas, um, yeah. And, and LSD. But I, they do this, right? Some of them take you up. Some of them take you down. Yeah. And and so did you mix them for functionality? So you take some that were bringing you down and then take yeah, some to get... Yeah, it's just different things for different... Like if I went to work and then I do math and mm -hmm. then when I come home, I do a little bit of heroin and then I'm ready to go to bed at night. I take a couple of Zanny bars and go to sleep. Tanny bars, what's that? Zanny bars, like Xanax. Oh, Zanny bars, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, Xanax. Uh, okay. Mine was, the baseline was heroin, but along with that heroin, I was always doing something on top of it. So I always had heroin and then I would either do Coke or Zannies or... A little bit of meth. I didn't do too much meth, but every once in a while, or just anything on top of it, I had to have heroin. Yeah. First. Yeah. Uh, I battled over the years. Uh, in the past, it was heroin, but these last few years have been meth. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm the same way. I started out with heroin, and I, I got off of heroin for the dependency, but I got into meth, and I would use meth to bring me down, but... There's been periods of time that I would use both at the same time. Oh, okay. What's speedballing? That's what it speedballing is. That is that what that is? A burner downer at the same time. Same what time. does that do to you? I mean, it, it makes you high, <laughs> but but it it did the two counteract each other so you're not droopy or hyper, um, but you're still high. When I would speedball with math, it would give me the speed of math, but the pain relief of the heroin would take away from the lack of eating that I've been doing, no sleep. The aches and pains would go away, but I would still have the energy from math. I gotcha. Yeah. And what's coming down off that, I feel like? Death. Really? It's even worse? It's not fun. Yeah. Uh, once I got high, I didn't want to come down for that reason. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hmm. What else did family members know, you think? I mean... Their loved one will thank them in the end after it's all said and done. Uh -huh. It'll be terribly, terribly hard in the beginning. They'll tell them they hate them and they'll kick and scream, but in the end, they'll thank them. Mm -hmm. Tough love is kind of like... Uh, Tough love with a child in that when you say no to a, a two-year-old and they lay on the floor and throw a fit, it's amazing how many 
parallels there are between that and the fits that we, we can throw to try to get our way in addiction. It's mm -hmm. almost about the same. Yeah. Because uh, they say when you start doing drugs, like a lot of it, then you start to, uh, you know, you, you freeze there, you don't get mature. You mm -hmm. just sit right there in that, that yeah, time frame. Yeah, I've heard that, that your level of, is it intellectual and social maturity stops? Arrested development. Arrested, Arrested development. development. So your loved one will look you right in the face and lie to you, and it's not that they don't love you; it's that they, they, they can't help themselves but lie. Right. You know. Yeah. The fear, the fear, and the drug takes over. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's hard to accept that when you're on the on the side of the table of the parent or the brother or the sister or the uncle that's clean that's trying to help someone maybe they never used any drugs and and it's so hard to say to someone who won't admit they're lying i know you're lying i can't hardly do it to you <laughs> last time i did it to you yeah but i mean it's you know so it, it really takes a lot of guts on a parent side especially a mom i think because it's their baby to be able to say the best thing I can do for you is not help you at all and not let you live here anymore mm -hmm. and so did some of your parents eventually say that to yeah, you? I'm here. my mom has a five year protection order on me um, I wasn't even allowed to use her Wi-Fi at her house um, the only thing a parent can do is control their own actions and if their actions completely eliminate any help towards anything that they can do to get drugs. That is the only thing that they can control. If the person that's using their loved one has to rely on only themselves, that is the closest thing they can do to help them towards the broken state that they need, that they know that they need help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I stole from my mom and she didn't put me in jail. Mm -hmm. And that, if she would have put me in jail, that could have stopped me from using at that point for a period of time. And being in jail, being isolated away from everyone is not fun. But, and it, it, I know it's not fun for a family member to put you in jail. And everything in society is going to tell you that you're doing wrong by putting your loved one in jail but if they're going to steal from you repeatedly then by not putting them in jail they're you're enabling them to keep doing that yeah well i would believe on some, in a certain situation like that i would come up with with this spot here either you want to go to a ministry or you want to go to prison you make the choice right. i don't care right either way I go you won't go one of them Right, absolutely, absolutely. You know, which I prefer to come here. Right. But it makes it a little bit more, you know what I mean? But there's a lot of people that would choose jail over recovery. Oh, and it's a lot easier. Because you just got to do your time yeah. and get back out and start where you left off. Mm -hmm. um, what did your mom say to you? It was actually my dad. Your dad? <clears throat> I was just moved back with my dad. He uh, actually just got out of rehab. He's doing all right. And then... Um, I would sell, he had a PlayStation for his grandson, my brother's kid, a PS4, and I would take it and pawn it, and then when I got paid, I would get it out of the pawn, and so I noticed he'd come to my room and check, and he would just, he would just leave, wouldn't say nothing, and then the day I pawned it, he came in and said something, and grabbed my arm and looked at the inside of my arms, said, you gotta go, dude, you can't do this no more, so, uh, he watched me pack my stuff and load my truck up, and I was leaving, I could see him out the blinds looking. I know my dad had tears in his eyes, I could see him. And yeah. I could tell it hurt him real bad. Yeah. It's me and my dad, my other two brothers aren't close to him, but me and my dad are best friends. Wow. And so I've been doing the rehab thing for almost two years, and he's stuck with me right by my side. Mm -hmm. It done, did the best thing he could do. Yeah, because he's went through it himself. Yeah. So he knows, you know, he knows what to look for and what I'm going through, and I can talk to him. and. At the end of the day, I thank him and yeah. thank God. Yeah.